Good morning everyone. Today I am going to speak on the poem Old on a Grecian Urn. This poem is written by famous poet John Keats. Now, let me tell you about this poet in brief. John Keats was born in London. He is a famous romantic English poet and his poetry is known for its sensuous appeal by depicting his love for beauty, by depicting his love for nature. He makes the readers to see, hear, smell, taste and touch the objects he describes in his poetry. Another salient feature of his poetry is his love of beauty. And you all know what this poet has said about beauty. He has said, beauty is truth and truth beauty. His notable works include Ode to a Nightingale and Slip and Poetry. This young poet died at the age of 25 due to tuberculosis. These are some of his famous poems to Lord Byron, Fancy, La Belle Dame Sans Mercy, Oran Melancholy, and to Autumn. Before I move to the text of the poem, let me tell you about this poem in brief. Ode on a Grecian Urn is about the permanence of art, love and beauty. The urn is an unravished bride, referring to the purest form of art. And the beautiful scenes painted and engraved on the urn reflect the fleeting nature of life and the ultimate reality in life that is death. The poet beautifully depicts how generations after generations go with the gust of the wind, but what remains permanent is love, beauty and art. So the art in the form of the engravings on the urn the unheard melodies sung by the musicians, the mad pursuit of the lover after his beloved and the beauty of the forests. The ocean and the coastal life is perennial while the men and women depicted on the urn are the characters making their entrances and exits in this world. These men and women are frozen in time as we see them on this ways. The poet says that in human life what remains permanent is the art and its beauty. And it is passed on from one generation to the other in the form of art, that is, urn, here, and that is the beauty and truth of the art. This is what all human beings must understand and must pass on to the next generation. Now, I am going to read the text first. And then we shall begin the discussion. Or on a Grecian Urn by John Kitts. Thou still unravished bride of quietness, thou foster child of silence and slow time, Sylvian historian who cast does express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. 
What leaf-ringed legion haunts about thy shape? Of deities or mortals, or of both? In tame or the days of Arcady? What men or gods are these? What maiden's loth? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore, you soft pipes play on, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared pipe to the spirit deities of no tone. Fair youth, beneath the trees, thou cast not leave thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare. Bold lover, never, never cast thou keys, though winning near the goal eight. Do not grieve, she cannot fret, though thou hast not thy bliss. For ever will thou love, and she be fair. Ah, happy, happy bows, that cannot shade your leaves, nor ever bid the spring adieu. And happy melodist, unweared, for ever piping songs, for ever new. More happy love, more happy, happy love. For ever warm and still to be enjoyed, for ever panting and for ever young. All breathing human passion far above, that leaves a heart high sorrowful and quiet. A burning forehead and a parching tongue. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar? O mysterious priest, leadest thou that heifer lowing at the skies, and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed? What little town by river or seashore or mountain built with peaceful citadel? Is emptied of this folk, this pious morn. And little town, thy streets for evermore will silent be, and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can ever return. O attic shape, fair attitude, with braid of marble mean and maidens overwrought. With forest branches and a trodden beat, thou silent form, dust teases out of thought as doth eternity, cold pastoral. When old age shall this generation vest, thou shalt remain in the dust of other o than ours, a friend to man to whom thou sayest, beauty is truth. Truth, beauty, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know. Let me begin the discussion here with the first stanza of the poem. In the first stanza of the poem, we see here that the poet is addressing the Grecian on. The poet says, Thou still unravished bride of quietness. The poet is addressing the Grecian urn and says that this Grecian urn is unravished bride. She is pure, she is sacred, she is chaste. And this Grecian urn has married to quietness. The meaning is here that the sins depicted, the sins painted, on the Grecian urn tell the stories. So the silence that the poet observes in those scenes in which the time is frozen makes him to question about the scenes and the stories. In the second line of the poem, the poet says, Thou foster child of silence and slow time. O oh, 
Grecian urn. You are the adopted child of silence and slow time. Why does the poet is saying that the Grecian urn is the adopted child of silence and slow time? The reason is the scenes depicted engraved on the Grecian urn tell us the stories. There is complete silence. Everything is silent. Everything is frozen. The musicians, the nature, the men and women, everything is frozen here. So that silence on the Grecian urn tell some stories. And here the poet says, O oh, Grecian urn, you are a historian. The word Sylvian is derived from Latin and it refers to woods or forests. So the Grecian urn is a historian who tell stories. And according to the poet, a flowery tale that this historian is telling is more sweet than the poems written by the poets. What leaf fringe legend haunts about thy shape? And the meaning of the word leaf fringe is the leafy pattern that the poet finds around the edge of the Grecian urn. So after having a close look at this Grecian urn, he finds scenes and then he starts thinking what stories this Grecian urn is going to tell. Let us see what the poet has to say in the next five lines. What leaf fringed legion haunts about thy shape? Of deities or mortals? Or of both? In tame or the days of Arcady? What men or gods are these? What maidens loved? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? The poet takes a closer look at the Grecian urn and he observes the beautiful scenes painted, engraved on this Grecian urn. And after having a look at the men and women, he questions, are these the gods or these are the human beings or both? And then, after having a look at this Grecian urn and the beautiful paintings on it, he starts thinking about the place. Is it the tame or the valley of Arcade? What men or gods are these? Are these the human beings or are these the gods? What maidens lot? He happens to see the beautiful women and they are unwilling. What mad pursuit! So these young men are madly running after these maidens, unmarried girls and they are unwilling. What struggle to escape as these men are chasing these beautiful girls they are trying to make an escape. They are struggling to escape. So the poet is questioning, who are these? Are these the men or are these the gods? And who are these women who are unwilling? And what mad pursuit is it that I see that these men are running after these beautiful women? who are unwilling, 
who are not ready to do what the men want them to do, what struggle to escape. So as these women are not willing, this results into struggle. And when these men are chasing them to catch, probably in love, these women are struggling to make an escape. At the same time, the poet finds a scene in which he sees the musicians and then he questions what pipes and timbrels what celebration is this what wild ecstasy what excitement is this so here after having a closer look at this Grecian urn the poet starts thinking and he asks questions to the Grecian urn what stories you want to tell? When I look at you, when I look at the beautiful scenes, when I look at the men and women in those scenes, the question that comes in my mind, are they the human beings? That is the mortal. Are they the gods? And what place is it? Is it a team? That is a valley? Or the dales of Arcadia? A region of ancient Greece? Who are these men? Are these the men or gods? Why these women show unwillingness? And what mad pursuit is it? Why these men are madly running after these women? And why these women are struggling to make an escape? And what about these musicians? What celebration is going on? Is it a celebration? What wild ecstasy? What kind of excitement is there? So this is what the poet questions to the Grecian urn. The Grecian urn? That the poet says, is unravished bride of quietness and this Grecian urn is the adopted child of silence and slow time slow time as everything is frozen in those beautiful paintings that the poet finds on the Grecian urn Now, let us move to the next stanza of the poem. Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore, you soft pipes play on, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared pipe to the spirit deities of no tone. The poet here says, that heard melodies are sweet. We often listen to music. So that music is very sweet. It appeals to us. But the music that we haven't yet heard is more sweet, is more melodies. And that's why, oh, you musicians, what you should do? You play your musical instruments. You play your flutes. And this music that is there on the Grecian urn, it is not to the sensual ear. It is not for the sensual ear. Means it is not for the mortal human beings. But it is for endeared. Endeared means more sweet, more loving. And this melodious music is for gods, for supernatural elements. And the music that is there, that we human beings cannot hear, that music has no tone, no sound, so that 
Music is for gods. Fair youth beneath the trees. Now the poet finds a young man sitting under the tree. Thou canst not live thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare. The poet, while observing the scene, finds the young man under the shade of the tree and says, Oh, you young man, you are singing a song and you can never stop singing that song. Nor ever can those trees be bare. Those trees are full of green leaves. So that greenery is going to be there forever. The trees will never shade their leaves. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss. Though winning near the goal, it do not grieve. The poet here in these four lines addresses the lover now and says, O oh, you lover, alas, you cannot kiss your beloved. Though winning near the goal, it, though you are very close to her, and you are about to catch her, you are about to kiss her, but you can't. Do not grieve. So don't be sad. Don't feel bad about it. Why? The poet says, she cannot fade. She cannot fade. Her beauty will remain permanent. Her beauty will remain permanent source of joy for you. Though thou had not thy bliss. Though this is the time for you just to chase her, just to follow her, just to look at her and just enjoy the beauty. Though you are not blessed with her kiss. Forever will thou love and she be fair. So this is how, though you do not have that opportunity to kiss her now, but you, you will follow her, you will chase her, you will have a look at her forever, you will love her forever, and she will be beautiful for you forever. So this art, this scene, this beautiful scene that is frozen in time on the Grecian urn is a permanent source of joy, is a permanent source of beauty. And that's why the poet says, truth is beauty and beauty is truth. In the next six lines, in the next five lines, the poet says, ah, Happy, happy bows that cannot shed your leaves, nor ever be the spring adieu. Now, after addressing the lover, the poet turns to the trees and says, O oh, you branches of the trees, you will never shed your leaves. You will remain green forever. And as you will remain green forever, you will never say goodbye to spring. Spring is going to remain there forever. And happy melodies unweared, forever piping songs, forever new. The poet now talks about the melody, talks about the music, talks about the musicians talks about the singer and says that the music played by this main it is going to be new forever and they will never become tired they will remain fresh forever their songs will never become old they will keep playing their musical instruments forever. More happy love, 
more happy, happy love. Now the poet turns to the lover and talks about the young man and his beloved. Now their love is definitely going to be full of happiness, full of joy. And that's why the poet repeats the word happy love. More happy love, more happy, happy love. This shows that though we human beings die, the feeling of love remains permanent. It, it is forever. So the beauty of love is the permanent source of joy that remains forever and that has to be enjoyed by human beings. Forever warm and still to be enjoyed. Now, this is the reference here to the beautiful women. So here, the poet has seen that the men, the young men are chasing these women. So here, their beauty is going to be the permanent source of joy, bliss and excitement. Forever panting, forever young. So these men who are chasing their beloveds, they will be out of breath. They will continue to chase them. And they will remain young forever. All breathing human passion far above that leaves a heart high sorrowful and cloyed, a burning forehead and a parching tongue. As the poet says, that everything is frozen in time. When he looks at the Grecian urn, he closely looks at the beautiful scenes and tries to make a sense. When he talks about the lover and their beloveds, we see that the lovers, that the men are seen chasing their beloveds. So this moment, the poet is observing very closely and he thinks that this is frozen in time. But in real life, what happens? Lovers sigh. They burn in the agony of love. And that's why the poet says the feeling of love in this life leaves a heart high, sorrowful, and cloyed. Men and women become sad, unhappy, a burning for it. The they are burning in the agony of love and parching tongue, as if they are got trapped in desert and they don't want water. They do not want water, but they want love. So the point says here that the human heart that is hungry for love is trapped in a desert and it is not thirsty for water, but it is thirsty for love. In the next stanza of the poem, the poet depicts one more scene. Let us see what scene is it and what the poet has to say. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar, O mysterious priest, leadest thou that haper lowing at the skies? all her silken flanks with garlands dressed. Now, the poet looks at the Grecian urn and there is one more scene in which he finds that a crowd of people, they are there and they are coming. They are coming for sacrificing an animal. 
and then the poet finds the platform there a plat a green platform is raised green altar and then he questions what green altar is it and what is this mysterious priest is doing here and then let us see what the poet has to say who are these coming to the sacrifice who are these people who are coming for sacrifice to what green altar o oh, mysterious priest leadest thou that haper lowing at the skies so this priest with so this priest is with these people they have raised the green platform and there is a cow and that cow is lowing while it looks at the sky the back of the cow is decorated with silk cloths and garlands so these people are there who are with priest they have raised the platform and they are there to sacrifice this cow that is lowing while looking at the sky probably this cow might have sensed that the time has come very close for her what little town by river or sea shore or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of this folk this pious mon the poet questions what town is it or what village is it is it situated on um, a riverside is it situated by a riverside or is it on the seashore or is it in the mountain region where we see the forts and then he questions why the town is empty why the town is empty the town or the village where nobody is there and why these people have come here at this holy time in the morning and probably he has already given the answer that these people have come together to sacrifice the animal the priest is there they have raised they have erected the platform probably to sacrifice the cow the cow that is lowing and looking at the sky what little town by river or sea shore or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of this poor this pious mon now when the poet finds that these people are there and they have come to this place to sacrifice the animal and they are there with the priest they have they have erected the platform to sacrifice uh, the cow now the poet questions what city is it what town is it what village is it is it situated by a river side or is it situated on the seashore or is it at the mountain region where we find the fort now the town or the village is empty nobody is there this morning and little town thy streets for ever more will silent be now the poet addresses the town now he don't know what town is it he don't know what village is it but he has to imagine and says oh thou town now your streets will be ever more empty no one would be there the streets for ever more will silent be there will be complete silence and there would be nobody there would there would be no body to tell why people are not there in that village or the town and even as there is not going to be anybody to tell when these people are going to return to the town or village o oh, antique shape fair attitude the poet now here addresses the grecian urn that is the beauty of joy fair attitude 
after having a close look at this Grecian urn, the poet finds it very beautiful that for poet that Grecian urn is the permanent source of joy. And what does he find? The marble mean and maidens overwrought. After having a look at the Grecian urn, he sees that there are men and women with forest branches and the trodden wheat. He sees the beautiful picture, the beautiful scene of the forest and the trodden wheat, that is the grass that is trodden by the people. Thou silent form does tease us out of thought as doth eternity, cold pastoral. So here the poet says that, Oh, you Grecian urn, you are the silent form of beauty. So, we human beings are mortal. We have pain. We suffer. Most of the time, we are sad, unhappy. There are so many troubles. So, I think you are teasing us as death eternity. Eternity that has no time limit. So here, you are teasing us. Why you are teasing us? Because you are art and you are going to be there forever. But we human beings are going to die. So it seems to the point that this Grecian urn, that is uh, the form of beauty, that is the source of joy and beauty, is teasing the poet who is a human being and is, he is subject to death. As human beings are subject to death, the poet thinks that we are going to die, but you are going to be there as the form of art. You, are, you, you have no time limit. You are going to be there permanent. Pastoral means what? A work of literature portraying an idealized version of country life. So here you are telling us the story of countryside life and that is full of beauty, that is full of joy. And when we look at you, the poet says, we human beings, when we look at you, we feel that you are teasing us. Why? Because we are going to die. We are subject to death. But you are not. You, in the form of art, is going to live, is going to be there forever. Though everything is frozen here on this Grecian urn, the men and women, the musicians, the forest, the branches of the trees. Everything is going to be there in frozen time. Now, I move on to the next part of the poem. When old age shall this generation vest, thou shalt remain in midst of other home than ours, offering to man to whom thou sayest, beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know. So the poet says here, when old age shall this generation vest, yes, we human beings are going to die. But you are going to be there. So you shall remain there. The poet says we human beings are going to become old and we are going to die. But you shall remain in midst of other. You are going to be there with the next generation. You will accompany them and you will be with them when they will be sad, they will be in miserable condition and you definitely are going to be a permanent source of joy for them. The way you are the permanent source of joy for us, similarly, you are going to be the permanent source of joy for them. We are going to die. But you, as the form of beauty, but you, as the form of art, you are going to remain permanent. And you are going to be there from one generation to the other. So, you will be a source of joy. You will be the source of inspiration for the next generation when the next generation will too suffer like us. 
So you are going to be a friend. You are going to become a friend. You are going to be a friend to the next generation. And to the next generation people, you will pass this message. Beauty is truth. Truth, beauty. That is all you know on earth and all you need to know. So this is how the poet is presenting very beautiful idea, his philosophy that beauty is truth and truth beauty. Dear students, uh, these are some of the questions that you have to read and then you have to try to answer. Thank you very much.